it, it, it implied, if you just read it, maybe you thought something about like just being out in nature in some peaceful environment. But really, the real wildness is being able to be in the city or in the moment of the chaos or in that accounting uh, mess that you're trying to do for taxes or whatever it is that's challenging for you. And to feel nature and to stay in touch with what we are. And so the second point is practical examples of using how we use on our farm nature as mentor and talking about the engagement group and what we can do together. And um, so <laughs> an Amish mentor of mine once said, the hardest ground we'll ever face is that between our ears. <laughs> and I think it's definitely true um, in permaculture. Uh, a lot of my mentors and teachers say the only limit is our imagination. So when we feel like we're stuck or we're not progressing, usually it's our own stories and our own mindset and our own patterns that are limiting us. So sometimes coming together in groups like this, we interact and we get to break that pattern or see a mirror or something shifts, like you said, a positive disruption. And uh, in our grazing courses, we teach about, in our Grow Your Soil courses, we teach about disturbances. And there is an idea that a disturbance can be a, a net positive. Um, and you guys are all nodding, so you're really in line with this. So, pretty much the way I approach it is trying to really learn about what are nature's principles, whether permaculture coined them, or holistic management, or NRCS, or whoever, they all came from nature. So. They're nature's principles, you know. People have just observed them and put them together in words and described them and systematized them and ex to try to explain them to each other. But really, if you think about it, it's like you could have a PhD in honey and have the best words to describe honey, but would it really give you the feeling of tasting it, experiencing the honey? So the description of the principles and things is really different than the feeling of embodying them and letting them work in our lives and in ourselves and in our bodies and in our human families and systems and communities. So it's good to understand them and words are a way we can communicate them, but there's there's something more. There's there's other experiences. So learning about tools, techniques, strategies, we could go into an ad infinitum of tools and techniques that mirror human nature. And any of you could probably think of at least hundred in your life that you already do. Um, hopefully, one of my goals is that each of us, maybe we get some new ideas or we hear from someone, something they do that inspires us. And then mentors who have experience, and that, in my journey, I've had a lot of amazing mentors. I would never be where I am without mentors. And I've begun to learn that nature is my biggest mentor. So I want to talk about, you know, using technology to hone our senses. And Dan and I really share this fundamental belief. It's like, Eventually, you know, we talk on the phone as friends, and and it's like, you know, for me, sometimes going down this data path, it it has a danger. There's a peril that we can be aware of of losing our senses and you know looking for the weather on our phone instead of tuning in to what's going on. Like, well, it's some clouds outside, you know. So the technology cannot either numb our senses because we just mindlessly look to it to give us answers. Or I can hone our senses, and I did more soil biological food web testing than anyone in the U.S. except Elaine Ingham in her lab, and I learned through that that you don't actually need to test as much as you would think to know what's going on, and um, the plants and animals are our best living laboratories. And so, what I did was learn what I I first observed what I was sensing, what the ground felt like, what it smelled like, what it tasted like, what the plants looked like, what they tasted like, and then the test could verify what I was possibly sensing, um, or give one data point or several data points around that, because our, our sensory is a data point. Like that's really important to remember. Like we have more sophisticated data monitoring than any tool that's invented yet. So. It's all about keeping it in perspective. You know, when you're looking at a test, it's a snapshot in time, and, and your observation is a snapshot in time. And we could go even deeper into what the observe, you know, with quantum physics, the fact that someone's observing an exper experiment changes how the particle behaves. So when we're observing our natural systems or our bodies, the judgment or the way we observe that, if we're 
separate from it, it creates a different result. And sometimes that creates us being in a box instead of being infinite potential that we are. And so I think in all the observation, I want to encourage you guys, remember nothing else from what I say, when you're going home and observing, it's one thing to be aware of a problem. It's another thing to fixate on it and create more of it. That by feeding it energy, there's a Native American saying about a white wolf and a black wolf representing good or evil, light or dark, opposite states. And it, the, the question is, which one survives? And the answer is whichever one we feed, whichever one has food, right? So every time we're thinking of something, it's like putting a piece of currency in a piggy bank. And where are we depositing our energy? Who has the mic in our head? Is it, are we observing with a judgmental mind? Are we observing with a true observational mind? Truly observing is not really making a judgment. And there's a difference between that and that causes a lot of problems in our human relationships when we feel judged or perceive judgment when someone's just making an observation or we jump to judgment when really we could just make an observation and not attach more to it. So um, I really just wanted to talk about that in general to keep in mind while we go into more detail because um, it's a sticky ground and the practice of it is very fluid of how do we observe about our systems. And um, I had a mentor, she's a business coach, and she, has anyone ever walked or hiked on a ridge, like a, a steep ridge where like beside you, you wouldn't want to step off because you would go <laughs> down. Like you'd go, so you're going up the mountain, but you're like on a ridge. So she, she talks about life like that. And if we're looking down at the ridge and like over here is um, like this is the path, we can see into the valley where we might not want to fall. We can see, you know, lack or fear or judgment, you know, doubt, not enough, not enough time, not enough money. Oops. And then, but it's like, if you've ever driven on a highway where they have those little pullovers, you know, and sometimes they might even have a bench, you can sit there and observe it. So it's not that we don't want to be aware of our problems, we don't want to put blinders on, but we want to sit with them and be closer to them um, and be still with them and, and observe where are they really coming from and are they really true. But when we, when we actually take action, we might want to edge over a little bit, just, just walk a little bit further away. When we actually take action, we want to take action from a place of truth, of infinite potential, love, whatever you want to call it. And um, because it's not enough, the science is now proving that this is our story in our minds. This is a perception. It's not actually the way the universe and the natural systems pattern themselves or work. So we'll talk about that with time and matrix and decisions, but um, I'm jumping in my moment on my second slide. So, uh, <laughs> so basically we are nature. Nature's everywhere. We, from the tiniest recesses of our atomic quantum structure to the vast expanses of whatever we know beyond us. And um, this is something that really has been important. And a number of you guys I was talking to over the weekend, it's really important, I think we can take an extremely deep level that has to the highway and it's a rain. And Elaine Ingham first taught me that. She said it's like the Goldilocks principle, too much, too little, too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry. And a lot of times farmers, that's all you hear. Oh, it's not raining. Oh, it's raining too much. Oh. You know, but really, health is a highway. And even on a straight highway, you have to always micro, you know, you're steering left and right a little bit. And the way I like to think about our human systems, whether it's my farm, it's most economical, profitable, and fun, if we, and effective, if we can only be steering those little nudges. And not steering blindly and keeping steering to do the same thing repeatedly, because Let's just say you put compost or chicken litter down or something, and it helped. You put lime. Well, okay, that works so well. We do it the next year. We do it the next year. Pretty soon, you're off the road on the other side. And even if something's beneficial, there's a time to stop doing it. You don't have to do it anymore. Even with mulching and perennial gardening and permaculture mulching, um, I was talking to someone last night, and he just had all this wood chip, and he just wanted to use it. I don't know if it's in the room. But um, <laughs> he wanted 
wanted to use it. And he kept going, how do I get it to break down more and more diversity and more? And he's planting like apple trees and things and bushes. And I'm like, well, in nature, you don't really see mulch built up that deep. And I was trying to tell him, there's timings, there's patterns. The, the, the trees drop their leaves so that the fungi can build over the winter. But by spring, when the ramps and other things that aren't as fungal come up, all those tannins and things are already a little bit more broken down. So there's a whole different ecology in the spring than in the fall. And, you know, it's if you're trying to plant trees or bushes in your perennial systems that are not a climax succession, yet you're putting enough carbon, I mean, way too much carbon, or even carbon from other species of trees, right? It's going to feed a different ecology. So just think about, like, it's not just like more carbon is better, and you guys all know that, but, you know, I continually think about what we're doing or what I'm taught to do, and I'm always looking at it with a fresh mind. You know, and that beginner's mind is something that's really important. So I just wanted to use some striking visuals, and I'm sorry I did not quote the source on all of them. They came from all from Google Images. Um, but if anybody wants to know the source of the picture, they are not mine, um, and they're available online. But basically, I was trying to think of all the patterns in nature, and I just I gave up. But these are me, and the ones I want to focus on are really the waves and spirals and branching right now. Tessellations, what I was taught tessellations in permaculture was like our bones, like the hourglass shape. Um, they could be any length, but then when I looked it up on Google, it said it was like a repeated pattern of a cube or a square. So, um, and everything being fractal, like just mathematical sequences of repetitions of these patterns in different orders of magnitude. And so, if you think about a wave, this is really, you know, with each, within the space of each breath, many, many infinite times probably as many breath. We have the opportunity to move from a really ordered system. So you see how the wave is really glassy smooth, it's super ordered. And then that's confined by our previous stories of who we are, who we know, what we do, what we learn, what so-and-so said, our mentors. And, and I want you to go beyond what your mentors teach you if you're spiritual, you know, even in, in spiritual texts. Almost every spiritual prophet, like Jesus said, we're, go, we're here to do greater things, you know? So this is just the constraint of our mind, and it, it feels really good, and it's beautiful because it's structured. But what, what we need in every moment is this wave pattern of basically chaos. And this is the infinite potential. This water could fall anywhere. It could go anywhere. Like, it's broken out of the structure. And so that forming and reforming and reforming, that cycle, and that's the holistic management feedback loop of decision-making framework, if you guys have studied it. This one was even better because it was like a longer, you can really see that structure and really see the chaos. But um, it's just so beautiful, too, right? It's just, I don't know the mathematical sequence for that, but um, I did pick up surfing um, late in life. And uh, I don't live near the coast, so I don't get to do a lot. but. Um, it basically, if we can surf in our lives, uh, I have this phrase, it's a good thing I'm a surfer, because you know you can handle what comes to you. And uh, basically, we can enjoy the explosion and chaos, which is actually our infinite worth. And you know, loving myself and my neighbors, like knowing that I'm infinite worth and you're infinite worth. Too much egotistical of I'm the best isn't good, but also too humble of I'm not worth anything, or I'm not good enough, or I need to be better, or I need to have a PhD to be valued. That's also an ego problem. Like, they're both two, it's that Goldilocks principle. So it's not only knowing that everyone has worth, it's knowing feeling our own worth. And I want to get to that as what I feel in my paradigm, in my story and thinking, is critical to building this movement is that each one of us really finds our infinite work and specifically locating what we want to do right now in our lives in this moment in time and what we can give and releasing with a very conscious intention what is not ours to do but linking with others like a micro network so that that function can be done and it's only when we give it up we say no that the universe can fill that void with someone who's going to say yes but when we're trying to be the doer and control, we are not allowing that void to be filled and that reforming of relationship. So we are blocking the mycorrhizal structure when we try to be the doer or the wave pattern. Because actually I was thinking, it's like I got really deep into this, it's like, are these patterns really any different? Because this is actually a spiral. 
it's an evolving spiral. And it's also, as the water's falling, it's falling like a branching pattern. You know, like, are they really different patterns, or are we just labeling them as different patterns? This is a really cool one. So it's like, explore your unique divine potential and your infinite worth. So locate very solidly in what you're here to do right now, what you can do, what you love to do, that's your holistic context. How do you want your day to feel? So I just want you guys to have to do a little exercise. Just, um, I don't know if you have a piece of paper, or grab it, pen. Close your eyes, or, or not, if you need to close your eyes. And think about if you were given a terminal illness, guarantee that three years from now you would be dead. But anything you did in those three years, you could not fail. Write down what would you do. What would you spend your time doing? What would you do more of? Maybe you think about your family, maybe you think about your work, maybe you think about your spiritual life or your expression of joy or something for your health or your relationships. Anybody need more time? I know you can... And this is a great thing to go do when you have more time. Like actually spend 10 minutes, like set a timer, just spend 15 minutes on it because more stuff will come up. But now if you were told that in, you only had three months, in three months, but anything you did in that three months, you could not fail, what would you do? Yeah, my mom, like, see you <laughs> probably share it all. Feed the what? What'd you say? You said feed the what? what did you say? I said in my mind, like, save the planet, everybody would be, you know, but so sometimes I do this exercise, I think about what I would do for the world, but then also what would I do just for me, excluding <coughs> the world, you know, knowing that I am part of the world and I'm inextricably linked to the world. Like, so you could think of in terms of social goals but also make sure you locate in your body and like what would you do for your cells, your recreational vehicle for your spirit. This is our body. What would you do to honor it in your spirit's journey in this, in this part of your journey? Um, sort of. And then what you were told you had three days. Only three days to live. You were going to die and nothing, and you could do anything, but you would not fail. What would you do in those three days? Who would you see? Where would you go? What would you not do? <laughs> well, that's a hard thing to think about for some of us. But this exercise, it locates you in what you might explore doing or maybe more of in your daily life, and if you're not, if your daily experience is not full of these things, how can you get there, and what could you actually release doing that would free up energy? And who, even if you don't know who or what you need to call in, like, what could support you, what would you need to support you to do that, to feel really good doing that and feel supported, like everything else you needed to do was taken care of? And explore that. Because it is possible for each of us, and it's different for each of us, and because it's different for each of us, it's possible for all of us because we're all different. I mean, there's somebody or something or some organization or some function, there's something there that will fill that void if you don't do it. And maybe it's not even necessary at all. Maybe it's driven by these things, like we're not enough. Maybe, you know, do we need to get infinite degrees to feel worthy for education or do we need like it's usually our own standard of driving our own selves of what we believe we have to do to be a good person or to be worthy or whatever so um i feel like we're all waves each of us is very different 
And sometimes we ride along together, and sometimes we crash together. <laughs> we butt heads, you know? Um, but we're all the ocean. And we, are, we can be a unique, our best individual, most beautiful way we can be. And we're still the ocean. And there's other waves that will do the other things. And so, looking at spirals of how to get there, how do you get from where you are? to where you might have written down you might want to be if you had only limited time on the planet, which we do. I mean, as far as in this body, but uh, this form. But these spirals exist everywhere. And they have mentioning in the DNA and the replication of DNA and a lot of the minerals needed um, for the replication of that. And the vortex, um, Sometimes we get sucked into a vortex or what feels like a vortex where there's a powerful port we just get in a pattern and we can't seem to get out and it's pulling us. And maybe it's somewhere we don't think we want to go. Or maybe it's really somewhere we want to go and there's this power and we're being pulled. So it could, you know, I'm not putting a judgment on it, but one of my mentors taught me about something called a wormhole. And this is what, when you Google wormhole, what it graphically looks like in the universe. It literally... I don't know if you can see. It literally is where the universe folds. So if you're going through a wormhole in your life, it could be called the dark night of the soul. Like everything could be falling apart. Your house burns down. Your spouse dies, your children die, you get a terminal illness, diagnosis, you're in a bad accident, you go through economic crisis, whatever it starts looking like. And you start trying the things you've always tried to get out, your strategies, your story of what you need to do, and they're not working. You're trying the things that work, and they're not working, and you're stuck in this, what, this wormhole. And sometimes it's hard to see that it's a wormhole when you're in it. But what I've learned is that it's through the wormhole that we find our true purpose. And it relates to finding this mycorrhizal movement. What's necessary to achieve the movement is that we're not all trying to be the doers of everything, but that we use our life experiences to come out of this wormhole. And you talk, you, you see some of the people that have made the greatest changes on the planet, and they usually have a turnaround point in their life where something struck them, something changed them radically. For me, it was a, a, a life-threatening accident where I was crushed and all my spine ripped apart and my ribs ripped off and shoulders ripped off and lungs collapsed and heart collapsed for even things like that. And, and I was told I would never heal. But it's not true. I didn't believe the story. And nature wants to heal. Biological systems want to regenerate. And that's what Dan was talking about, the difference between a biological system and a mechanical system is the drive to regenerate continually. And um, of that wave pattern to go from order to chaos and have opportunity to reorder. And so, um, when you're in the wormhole, just know that it can be leading you to your truest gift. And if you didn't have to progress linearly across the universe that many miles, you would never get there in one lifetime. So you have to have the wormhole where the universe folds around you and then you, you pop out the other side. So be thankful for it and remember that it's part of nature. There is no, I used to train for the Olympics and my coach gave me when I was 18 a book called Mastery and the guy talked about progress and healing or learning and you know people want it to be like this but it's really like this and it plateaus and then it dips and then it goes up and it might look like the stock market but you know eventually um, you get to Mastery but when we're in the plateau or the decline we get attached to this and we use our judgment of the receptions to say, well, we're not doing it well enough or we're not, we're not getting it fast enough or it's not working or whatever, but you're, you're actually in the cycle of mastery. And so it's never a straight up. And then now I think of that as a spiral that's like moving and maybe even going upward. Because this is a linear graph, but life is not linear, it's in 3D. And so we're swirling around and progressing and growing and we, and we might meet each other. Maybe we go way over here, you know, but it's a spiral. 
So this is kind of theoretical, but my life sometimes feels like this one. Oh, <laughs> direction. So, but that energy is not as concentrated as something like this. So, when we focus, one of my other mentors said, "There's freedom through focus." And when I started my soil business, I was a farmer. I'd been on the farm. Never had to market myself. I worked for my family farm. We sold the commodity markets. You know, the way they were always there. You could just take the cows to market or take the corn to market. Well, moving into regenerative spaces and organic spaces and differentiating ourselves required marketing. And then when I left the family business because they didn't believe that chemicals were harmful after eight years of working with them and showing them biological systems, I left. And all I had was my computer and my knowledge. And what can I do with that? You know, and I decided, oh, I'm going to start a soil business, you know, helping people and um, maybe consulting. And then when I would talk to people about the soil, it's meant how like, and I'm like, okay, I see how this can heal every problem. It connected my degree in international studies, my work with women in water in rural Africa, my rural Virginia poverty. I could see how the dollars were flowing out of our rural communities into a few corporations and concentrating and the people were then buying back cheap food and exporting more dollars, and then they were getting sick, and they were exporting more dollars, and their life force was so low. We have 14-year-old kids with um, insulin pumps who are over 400 pounds. It's a regular thing in my community where I grew up, where I lived, or I moved one county over, but it's not regular to see people of a normal size. Like, most people are obese where I live, and um, there's no fresh, hardly any fresh food available for about 40 miles. So. Um, it's a uh, it's a challenge, and so I was like, how can I convey to people it's the power of what I want to do? So I, well, I found this webinar, and I got into this conscious marketing school because it was about how to find words, how to make the benefits of your work really juicy. And I'm still struggling with that, right? Like it's it's not easy because when you really talk about the real benefits, they're so big and so powerful, they sound fluffy, right? Who has like it's on fruit fruit. Oh, we can heal the planet. Oh yeah, you have to be like, go on, love well, among some trees, you know. It's like, no, this is real. Like it really relates to you and, and your food and your energy and you know, anyway, but one of the that mentor taught me, she said, if you try to market to everyone, you market to no one. And she's like, you have to focus. And I like she, she had in her webinar she explored something called multiple ideal client personality disorder. And how many of you in your business want to help everyone with soil or everyone with who eats food or everyone? Come on. <laughs> it's, it's like a chiropractor. Who's your ideal client? Everyone with a spine. Well, was that chiropractor making a lot of money? No, but when that chiropractor said, I really love working with prenatal and athletes. And they changed their website to really have images and language that really got inside the mind of someone who was a, a young mother or an athlete, their business exploded. And she was saying that it seems, and then I took a blogging course, and it's like, you actually want to blog with something on search terms that are, you get the fewest hits on Google. I'm like, what? Because then you have more chance of showing up. Like, you have to focus down, and from that very concentrated place, expand again. So there's like these constant cycles and patterns of expansion and contraction. And they're both needed. So um, there is freedom through focus. And trust that. So branching patterns. Snowflakes, beautiful leaves. And we all love this beautiful thing. So I was like, well, not too many, but there were just so many. Um, but I hope that this, when I look at this, I think about, oh, this is like the social media. This is like the researchers. And this is the doctors. And you know, like I. I see ourselves and our networks and the internet and our databases and you know the nutrients in the soil flowing and in the plants flowing and you know it's, it's all connected. So um, this is a tree, I know that. Okay. but it's really interesting. Our veins, the water falling, the rivers branching, the mycorrhizal and the roots. I mean, look at this everywhere. It looks so similar. <laughs> From a Google Earth image of rivers to right down in the soil to the mycorrhizal networks. And these mycorrhizal networks, this is what I want us to explore building with this tool is these little nodes. 
like we each have little nodes, but yet we're really connected. How can we use this tool to build these connections, but not get too distracted from like what we're here to do? Um, how can we mimic these patterns in our human design systems and this movement? I love some ideas from you guys uh, about this. Do you have any thoughts? Has this been stirring in you this week? Or if not, we can talk about it later. Anybody? Like, I was trying to make a mind map, and I was trying to do this on the PowerPoint slide, and I'm like, there's so many connections. It's more like a web, you know, and, and like everything's connected to everything, so how do you even draw that? Like, I, I failed miserably, but I thought we could at least put up where the way I, you know, and I didn't know what to put at the center. Sometimes a mind map has a center or a node, but I mean, there's pretty much, you've, you've got the research, like with this tool, and you've got education around what we find, like outreach. And that could be through social media, that could be through your meet, uh, monthly in-person meetup or just talking, that could be through online communities, group masterminds, like all sorts of stuff. And then you've got like private industry developing awesome products from inoculants to machinery or engineering, you know, solutions. And um, then you've got, I guess like doctors and things would be probably in education outreach, but that's also like services. Um, the policies, yes. And that's really interesting because Alan Savory, um, he really talks about policies being to really, usually lawmakers make policy against what we don't want or to try to prevent what we don't want. Really, it's totally different to focus on what you don't want versus turning around and focusing on what we do want and putting your resources there. It's like you're walking, looking at something, and you're like, what is that? And you're like missing this beautiful moon or sunset behind you. And you just have to turn around. Like, you're going towards the problem. You're like, what is that? I can to fix that, you know. And so, um, <coughs> come on, I'm forgetting some things. My brain is a little tired. Anyone else? Um, yeah. What do you guys think? We've been working on um, a map, open source mapping of data so that so people can connect like, the new density of food to a place on yeah, like data sharing. Like it's, it's data mapping, actually. I think the map is important. Because it's all about, it's all about place, really. You know, what's happening. Locating it, yeah. There's something that's... I'll just put it at the center of one health. Whatever that means. You, what it means to me may be different, but like they're all receptiveness. Then there's, of course, the consumers. I mean, all, all of us are consumers, so that's everybody. Yeah. And, um, What, any of you guys do something that's not in any one of these spheres? Well, how about a digital distribution network? Consulting, distribution. I'll put that down with the products. That's so important, right? The access to it that like we were talking about. Just project development. And then to capital. Yeah, like economics, capital, finance. And like they're not really related like this. Like that's why I had trouble. I'm like, how are the nodes and you know, is it important for us to really map it? 
figures, and it was part of the map of the movement. Um, and I think about sharing, like, mentorship, mastermind, Resources. apprentice, interns. Um, Resources are important. <clears throat> what about spontaneity? Yeah, that's that infinite potential for sure. Innovation or not? So, um, Alan, something about resources is if anyone says that like cattle are ruining the planet or burning fossil fuels are ruining the planet, he said something. I was in a webinar. Um, I work with grazers all over the planet, and some of my grazers were in Canada, and they got burned up by fires during our mentorship. And at that time, there were a lot of fires in California, and Savory Institute graciously announced this free webinar with Spencer Smith and, uh, and Alan. And I got online, and he's like, he said something that I never heard him say. It's probably in his book. But um, a resource can never be a problem. How could it? Cattle are resources. Oil are resource. It's a resource. But it's the management of it that's the problem. It's our pattern of how we're management, our timing, our patterning, our tools, our strategies, or our linkages are broken, or we're not including, we're excluding some big piece of the puddle in our puddle, puzzle in our thinking. <laughs> Um, and so that's really important and it's like something that almost anyone can get that, the way he said that it's like well that stops the debate right there <laughs> you know I mean yeah okay um, just you know learning cattle grazing uh, and cattle being a resource and I, I agree that there's a much better system in place where cattle uh, can be used to you know mitigate damage and to help soil growth yeah, um, but uh, and soil biodiversity, but you know it's also responsible for more greenhouse gases than airplanes, cars, trucks, the cables, all, of, yeah. all combined. You know, so that's that's the reality of it. But that's how we manage them. Yeah. It's how we manage them, but it's also you know if you look at even even cows are managed properly, still go through twenty five hundred to five thousand gallons of water. But they actually give it back. So that analysis, I want you to go deeper with that, um, is the cow's manure is actually a lot of liquid back on the land. And it's one of the best ways to hydrate the land. The cow's digestive system. So a lot of these mathematical calculations, like I said, they're not they're not including the other end of the picture, the cycle. They're not looking at the whole cycle. So a cow managed well on pasture is actually carbon negative. It actually sequesters part of sequestering more carbon than ever than it would emit. And the cattle eating corn have a much more a totally different set of microbes in their gut where they do emit more methane. I mean our cows on pasture do fart for sure methane, but they also and they do drink a lot of water. But they actually what what is until I had cattle I never respected this and I think the problem is a lot of people believing and watching these things have never been around a cow. Or even if they have, they haven't really been paying attention because that manure is really wet. And when and they definitely haven't been paying attention enough to what happens when that manure is laid on the soil to everything around it. Right? So it was only by being in relationship with nature that I have a if I hadn't, I probably would be believing that and probably a vegetarian and probably thinking that that cows were the problem. Like, it would be very compelling, some of the stories that are being told. But again, are those people that wrote those stories actually observing cattle and the natural system? Are they observing nature? Um, most of them aren't. I think the guy who wrote Conspiracy was a dentist, you know, in California. So has he been on, I mean, maybe he's seen cattle badly managed too. I don't know, but it's, I remember going back in the early 2000s to ecosystem services conferences about carbon sequestration, and there'd be like top, top people, hundreds of people from around the world, and I'd raise my hand and say, are you considering the soil fungi role in carbon sequestration and your mathematical calculations? No. Well, you know, this is back in like 08. Now, I'm sure they are probably. But, you know, it, it's just, we're only as good as the lenses and glasses we put on and the stories we're believing and telling. So it, that's why I come back to always question, and I'm always questioning, right? So 
whatever I say today, it's not necessarily what I'm going to believe when I go deeper with it. Like it's a fluid thing, but my experience of the cattle and this global warming is they actually build soil very fast. Like the fastest, you know, one of the fastest animals and systems to build soil. Like I could go with my spray rigs and spray microbes and put compost and use cover crops, but it wasn't as fast and much less as cheap or burning less fossil fuel than, than the animals. So I saw how the plants need the animals. Um, so it's just, I don't, you know, we don't, we can get down into the weeds with any debate, but it's the patterning of, are we really observing nature when we're making certain assumptions about nature or calculations? Yeah. I think one word on that paper that separates us is resources. Separates I, humans from resources. each other. I don't even know what it Conflict like over resources. Just the word resources separates us from nature. I uh -huh. don't even know yeah. when it was coined, if it was through the Forest Service or the BLM or whoever. Right. But sometimes I wonder if it wasn't a government agency. It's something we manage started it's to work. ours to possess and use and not us. And it, and it bypasses our relationship with air, water, and soil. Well, in holistic management, people are resources. Ideas are resources. Like part of one of my company, you know, this one of my biggest assets are my ideas. Like. And my, my experiences, I consider those resources. So yeah, it depends on what how you define it, um, whether it separates you or connects you, um, or us. Finding people that live in possibility, that encourage us to always, and encourage those thoughts that we have, those ideas that we have, so they don't squash you down when you say, you know what, I'm thinking about creating a path that does this. Right. So you always come up with that new, the creative, the possibility of brilliance. And a friend of mine, he actually is teaching, uh, he's in uh, Vancouver, and he teaches, uh, he calls it Aquarian Luminosity, it's a program for leadership in this age. He's like, we need a, more leaders, you know, and we need to train leaders. Um, we need implementation, so we need people doing, and he spoke about uh, it's with capitalism, there's a way which capitalism can be like, oh, I'm gonna cut your out of the market share, I'm gonna you know, squash your idea or whatever, and there's a different type of relationship where we can be like, that's really cool, and you know what, I can do it this way too, or I can then you build on each other, and that innovation, I think that was one here somewhere, um, becomes dynamically, and you start to gain power by sharing power and ideas and collaborating, which everyone, I mean, you guys are all here because you're collaboratively minded, but a lot of people and a lot of, we're taught that there's not enough, and, and it's very real, but I live in places where there isn't enough for those people in that kind of place to survive well. Um, it can seem like a very real thing, and that's also why I believe that the soil is important because if we can create more abundance of water and food, and, you know, people are less likely to be able to be radicalized or controlled by someone who controls the resources um, because they have plenty of, they have stability, resiliency. Um, but that I wanted to talk, I'm not sure which slide it was, but um, about decision making in time management and okay we there in one hand we're saying there is time is limited we have to choose you have to focus we're talking about freedom through focus but then in doing that you're doing that not from a place of saying time is limited and it's finite you're not playing we have to get out of what's called the zero sum game you guys know what that means where anyone not know what it means so zero-sum game is that there's only like this box and if you do this there's only this much left like and that's it it's finite now the more we explore political relationships and uh, I first heard of it studying politics in college international politics and policy making and then I now heard of it more around life coaching, quantum physics, like the universe doesn't actually look like a box. 
and it doesn't behave like a box, and our cells and atoms don't really behave like a box. So I'm not sure this is a really great model for what time is. But time is definitely not shaped like a box, probably. Um, I'm not a brilliant mathematician. But um, what I can say is in my life, if I say, well, if I do this, then I won't have time for my children. I don't have children, but I, whatever. You know, if I do this, I can't do this. Now, in one hand, it may seem to be true, but let's say it's a decision of like taking care of yourself, some self self care. Like, okay, I'm going to take 20 minutes and go sit in my garden or whatever I need to do, and then I can't spend that with my child. But what if when you're with your child, you're not really present? You're stressed, you're on the phone. Is it better that if you go spend that 20 minutes, when you're with your child, the child will actually feel more quality of the experience because you're more present. And you're, you know, so it's not really a zero sum game. It's you get that and that. You get to take care of yourself and your child. And so I used to beat myself up. My, I call her the Lucy voice in my brain because if you had no child around the comic. Yep. I saw a comment where Lucy was off, she had set up a little table, she was offering advice for 10 cents, and Charlie Brown came up. You know this one? Have you heard this? <laughs> so um, Charlie Brown comes up, and, and Lucy just rails on everything that's wrong. Oh, you don't do this, you do this, you do too much of this. And he goes, well, what am I supposed to do about it? And she goes, I don't want to tell you what's wrong, I don't offer solutions. <laughs> <laughs> so like, a lot of people in the, are really being the Lucy, just come, you know, what is the solution? And in our minds, my mind has a Lucy, and when I recognize that's who's got the mic, and I'm okay, Lucy, but great, you know. So <laughs> it's like this voice that's like, if you do this, you can't do this. You can't have it all. You want it all. You can't have it all. You can't have like health and money and success, you know, whatever. Like we tell ourselves these stories, but they're actually not true because I. And I know that because I've experienced people who have lived out of the box, not thinking in a zero-sum mentality, thinking in this infinite potential of this. Every moment is a chance for renewal. And if they make a certain choice clearly, you know, no, they have to choose between their child soccer game and something with their husband. And they make the choice. Like, the important thing is to make a choice and own the choice. And then trust, like, I'm not doing that right now. And then trust that the universe is going to fill whatever intention. But I have the intention that I'm going to be able to, you know, or this thing that's important to me is going to be valued or the person is going to feel valued. You know, it's the intention behind how you make a choice. If you make the choice out of stress and fear and doubt and like not enough and zero-sum game, that person or thing that you're not choosing is going to feel that vibration and they're going to experience that and you're going to reinforce this belief that there isn't enough. So our stories are self-reinforcing, and um, sometimes really hard to get out of the pattern back into the infinite potential. And so I believe that we need each other. We're here for a reason today talking about this, because the more we can support each other to be this and do this and make our choices, and the more we can use the technology not to dull our senses, but to accentuate and accelerate this potential learning and potential growth we become like that way that we're exploding the infinite potential. And I think that's the only way forward. And I really feel like, you know, when we were talking about like Monsanto and big corporations or whatever last night, um, I believe one of my greatest mentors is Will Allen from Growing Power. And he's like, everyone has to be at the table. Like, mm -hmm. everyone. And I would say, not only do we just build something that works, so, but we also, and invite them, but we also, let them know we need them, you know, like, and they're important. And that's a whole different vibration. And it doesn't mean everyone's going to feel that or it's not going to solve all the issues. But I really feel like we do need them and we need to focus on building a system that works. And the way we do that is not trying to run around and do everything. It's actually to mimic the mycorrhizal the fungus. The fungus does not run around doing things. Like, but through the fungus, look at what happens. Soil structure gets built. That means the water gets filtered filtered, cal uh, carbon comes out of the air as it builds its body, uh, the plant gets fertilized, and on and on and on the list of work. Real effective efficiency gets done when that fungus doesn't run around being the doer, but it uses its relationships. It does what it naturally is made to do, and 
It's not running around trying to do all this stuff. So we just have to mimic fungus and embrace those relationships. Trust that the relationships are going to be there. Do take action out of, you know, out of truth, out of love. And sometimes love means compassion for ourselves. It means saying no to something because it's showing ourselves compassion and love. So making sure we treat ourselves as infinite worth and also others. And because when we do that and we express it, we can only choose how we show up. We can't choose how someone relates to us. But when we are owning it, and we're vibrating with that. Like there, if we're coming with the judgment, like, oh, I should have been there. I'm not good enough because I, I need to do this and I need to do that. And we show up and we're like, I'm sorry, I'm late, I'm stressed. And, you know, everyone around us starts to feel that vibration, but we're like, I'm here and I'm happy, you know, and comfortable with my decisions. And this is who I am. And everyone knows no one can do everything, right? Like, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned earlier the infinite self worth. I think it's a very important part of this system that you compare to the roots and the leaves and all that. Um, because I can relate to the feeling of um, like something happened to me and I, I gained weight and I wasn't still, I'm not as healthy as I once was. Um, and sometimes, especially when I'm around people that are promoting health and wellness, and, and a lot of those people are very healthy, it makes me feel somewhere inside of me. I can tell, I'm like, can I, can I, can I help? I'm not even that healthy. And so the infinite mm-hmm. self-worth helps us understand that at any level of health, even though we all want to improve, we are, we are worth, we have infinite self-worth before we're even healthy. Exactly. Yeah. And if we're always trying to get healthy, it's like yeah. the hair in front of our face. We have to feel that infinite worth. And, and that involves embracing that wormhole. Like, this is a wormhole for you. Like, when I could walk through with my arms, that was a wormhole for me. You know, and it's hard. And, our, you know, that was a deep lesson of, like, just, when are you going to stop saying that you're healing? Because you're always healing, you always be healing, which is true of a regenerative system for sure. But you're holding that state of health one step away, you know. Yes? It seems like possibly one of the most powerful patterns in nature is the wormhole that you showed because to me it, it represents birth and it's something we've all gone through. Like the birth canal, yeah. Whoa. It, well, it represents birth, but it also <laughs> represents it represents life, death, regeneration, and fear. Yeah. Because that You don't know what's fear, on the other side. Pardon me? You don't know what's on the other side. It's well, scary. Fear of success too. And and that's that's one of the that's like the thing that holds me back the most from my goals and aspirations. I think I see it in everybody else, but success and change and new ideas is represents birth, but also represents death of this illusion that we're stuck in place. You know, and then to change from that is is this sort of death, but to stay in that place is death. So oh. anyway, it's That's deep. Powerful. I remember, sorry, I remember write this down because I think this is really powerful. Did you guys all hear that? I had asked for some more mics for this session so we could get it on the live stream recording. But, um, so, and were you saying bro, that you were, your fear of your own success was really big for you? Sure. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Huge, right? Yeah. And then, yeah, so I think. I see this child, this idea, to be birthed, but I have to go through a wormhole and make it happen in some way. It's a different dimension that to get out on the other side of your fear. I can't And I think humanity, as a, like as a species, we're going through a wormhole, right? This pressure, it's like, oh, it can't get any worse. Oh my God, it can't get any worse. But it's like this pressure, and there's a tension in the dynamic release, and that's how systems grow. Yeah. It's pressure and release. Pressure and tension are growth forces. It's like plants that are grown in nurseries or in greenhouses without wind aren't as strong as the ones that have had a little bit of pressure, you know? Um, 
they can be strengthening. And so the key is um, my, my fiance's dad is an engineer, and he gave me some books when I, he was one of the few people that talked about permaculture. He was like, that is so cool. Like right off the bat, he was like, it was an hour, you know, we're sitting there talking. And he had all these books about systems and chaos and how they proceed to order. They go to chaos. Like, it's just um, the system gets more and more complex until it explodes to chaos, and then it gets more ordered, and then it gets more and more complex. And I was experiencing that on our farm with our team and just like things getting more complex until they exploded and then come back to simplicity, you know. And, um, so these are natural things. Like, um, anyway, I think, I don't know, where we are at time, I got lost. Can you explain one minute? It's 421 right now. So we could talk about practical farming examples of using nature as mentor. Yeah. Um, or we can stay in a space of infinite possibility. <laughs> weeds. Weeds. Not weeds. Who wants to talk about weeds? <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So this is one case study, and some of you may have seen it before. Um, it's also, I'm not going to have time to teach all of it, but it is online. You have a um, flyer about it. There's a free training, a whole recording of this whole presentation for free at um, gotweeds.solutions. And if you watch it, you put in your email, it just comes to us, we won't share it with anybody. And we'll send you a call recording once a month. We have a two hour phone call um, where we can come and talk about weeds. And um, we've got people from all over the world showing up. And if, even if you can't make it live, you'll get the call recording in your email. So we've got a sign up sheet and um, we can also send you the slides if you want, if you put your email down. And um, if you're interested in this topic, I'm not going to kind of teach it all, but this was our family farms when we were supposed to be planting corn. Um, and of course, that's why they had to use an herbicide to burn them down. A lot of farms. We had 40,000 acres in 14 different counties, and that was where I cut my teeth in farming. But um, very expensive logistical system, never had been profitable. Since my great grandfather it was done as a hobby and was subsidized by a timber business, subsidized by the mine, a, an extractive operation of extracting you know, timber and mine and then losing it in farming. And I came out of college into the system and I was just learning. Like I didn't, I'd been on horse farms, I really knew nothing hardly about agriculture. Thought I had to go get a soil science degree or something. And I was the first one that proposed pulling soil testing. So I, I was pulling soil chemistry because I knew nothing about biology and I was going to all the ag learning about um, you know what I should be doing on our fields and okay we should soil test and put it on our hay fields and nitrogen 80 pounds in the spring on the marsh grass and 50 pounds after each cutting and in and P and K to soil test and that was marching down my way and fields got a little better and then they crashed and the herbicides and anyway at that time was when I had the accident I was healing from the accident started I happened to be in a health food store to pick up an Acres magazine. I, I got like a Permaculture Voices magazine, an Acres magazine. I never, I live in the rural area, there's no health food stores. Like I was in, at the beach and I walked in this health food store and I got like a stack of 12 different magazines. Acres was one of them. I saw an article on compost of Rodale put out about these microbes in the soil. When you spray the herbicides, it compacts the soil and how the compost was way better. I showed it to my family, they're like, you know, and. <laughs> Within a month, I met Elaine Ingham and attended her training, and all of a sudden, all my questions, I was always the one with these questions for the ag people at the end of the seminar, like I'd be up in the, in the room with them, and they really couldn't answer my questions, and I was just like, is something wrong with me? Like, what's going on? And when I found out biological farming, I was just like, oh my gosh, like, this makes sense. So, um, you know, we had thorns, these are really thorny plants, we had bushy plants, we got florists and pokeberries in a cornfield. This was an organic cropping farm, 120 acres that I did no-till organic high biomass cover cropping and transitioned from chemical to organic um, back in 2009. And uh, basically my family was spending a lot of money on our designs. Um, and I want to bring this up because this is not my slide, but this is very this is a great example of how a system that does not mimic nature in that when you use an herbicide, it's like using one big hammer. And um, 
you know, that's what we did. We just wipe it down, burn it down, plant, you know, spray it again. Um, we really didn't take into consideration the whole natural cycle and all the places that weed populations could be influenced. Um, and uh, that was our tool, our one tool, right? And in nature, there's never one tool. And here, you know, the idea of like using lots of little hammers, right, with your plant populations, with cover cropping, with, you know, getting the soil, the seed bank. Um, and really, this talk is really going to talk about how to prevent weeds in Germany. Because Elaine Ingham said, oh, if you get the soil well, you right, weeds won't grow. And like, I sprayed compost on 1,500 acres and comp, uh, compost teas. And I was like, is this really going to work? Like, you know, is this really true? And I'm just one of those people, like, I don't believe it until I've done it or experienced it. I'm just, if you tell me I can't do something, I'm going to go try it. Like, it's just one, how I learn, and I really <laughs> learned the hard way, but I made my own choices. I've got a cow for them, and I learned a lot. And um, I can show you that I actually now understand, and a lot of you have probably already achieved this, where you, you have soil that doesn't germinate weeds or certain types of weeds because you've changed the soil environment. And it's not just the biology, it's the physics and the chemistry that go along with it. And I won't, um, but basically, this is a really great example of, I just put this together, and there's lots more functions of weeds, but this is just a list off the top of my head. And some of these I learned from being out in nature. Like, I remember I was at PASA a couple years ago, and Ray Archuleta was speaking, and we met, and I knew him already. We were walking down the hallway, and just, we had lunch together, and he was like, you must have read a lot, you know? And I. I was like, yeah, and then we're like a few more steps, and I was like, actually, I bought a lot of books, and mo I flew through them, you know, I read, but I was so busy farming and being outside that, like, I actually realized I hadn't read all those books, and I was like, that was like an aha moment, I was like, actually, I think nature has been my mentor more than the books, like, I would hear someone talk, I'd get their book, and, you know, have intentions of reading it, and but I'd really go try stuff, and I'd be outside, and it was really that that gave me some of my greatest realizations. And they're probably written down in the books, too. So um, I'm not the first one to have them. But uh, basically, you've got the healing disturbances. Pretty much everywhere we had weeds on our farm, there was something. Like, there was a swan crop field where nothing would grow but weeds. It just was different. Several of them. Two different examples. One was, I finally found out from an old person that this area had been where they put the logging deck almost 50 years ago when they cleared the hardwoods off the property, right? Like, and I can still see it in the patterning on the land. I started soil testing at different, say another thing, this is like when your family's a miner and thinks they can move around dirt, like no problem. I'm like, we planted these native warm season grasses fields and this big blue stem was doing great on this back 20 acres, but the, the up, the forward 10 acres, which was pretty flat, I was like, it just wouldn't grow well, and, and, and the compost tea, like we were testing it differently, and then I found out from the neighbor, oh yeah, they just came and dumped a bunch of mine tailings in there and like covered it with grass and made it flat. It used to be a valley, you know, and I was like, gosh, you know, it's it's really a different mentality, and that patterning was very evident in the land. It was a disturbance, you know, and, I, and, and they, I've read articles where, where someone fed the pigs the chemistry is different 50 years later where the pigs had a water trough and food, you know, so it doesn't have to be machine disturbance, but something was there, you know, and, and the, so the soil and the plants tell a story of how the water moves, they tell stories of wind or whatever it is, and it's just up to us to observe the patterns and, and work with them and um, through permaculture design, we can, we can sh help shift them if we, if we think it's appropriate, um, but Basically, I was looking at nutrient cycling, so I learned about eating my wheat, you know, I'm trying to heal. Well, wow, that chickweed and that lamb's quarter, like, put them in my green smoothies, right? Because <laughs> they're full of nutrient, or that, you know, put them down as mulch or put them in your compost. Like, they've got tons of minerals making, and um, bringing those minerals up from deeper in the soil profile, because we've got red, hard clay. I mean, it literally turns to brick. It's not a lot of work. It's weathered, old, alluviated soils in Piedmont, Virginia, um, I'm definitely a red dirt girl. Yeah. I only wear my nice clothes here because there's not as much red dirt. But, uh, <laughs> be funny. but uh, <laughs> you know, when the weeds are growing, they are bringing something that is 
deficient up, and when they fall down and, and lie down, they bring that nutrient into the top of the soil. Also, when they um, they might be taking up something that's toxic. So I learned a lot about phytoremediation and biological remediation. So breaking compaction in their deep tap roots, like in our no-till organic garden, we've got dock. Well, it has a tap root, or people say thistle, you know. Everyone has a weed bill. This is my nemesis weed. But when you really dig it up, it was only through digging it up, like building soil structure. I was at a video on our website called um, <coughs> Weed Root Ecosystem or something like that. But I was just randomly like in the field and the guy with the camera was there and I was digging. And I'd never done this before. I dug up a weed root and it, it was in the winter and it was covered in earthworms and the soil was beautiful and fluffy. And it was like, whoa, like this is what this weed is doing. What's the function of a dead weed? Or I'm in there, what's the function of a dead weed? And all of a sudden there's these dead weeds, pokeberries, and the birds are all lighting in them. It's winter and they're eating and my free range chickens are jumping up and eating. I'm like, well, that's a function of a dead weed. Or I'm walking through the field and there's spider webs everywhere. I'm like, gosh, chicory has flowered. And you know, then in October there's spider webs and the spiders are launching, you know. And I'm saying, well, that's a function of a dead weed, right? These are all these spiders and want fly control. Well, there's a lot of it, you know. And you go out at night and there's all these little shiny things in the grass. Spider eyes, you know, like so you see the functions, and it doesn't take rocket science to, to know that. Um, when you really see it happening in front of you, you experience it. And and who has gotten their pants wet walking around in tall grass or tall weeds in the mornings? Even in a drought, you know, we have 80% sometimes humidity in Virginia, so in the mornings, that's our only water in all these beautiful water droplets. If we mow them off, where, where's our water collection and antenna? Like, we now know that plants communicate. Well, how do they do that? Is it something to do with their structure and these antenna? I don't know. Probably. So why? There's a time when you might want to control a weed, but you want to do it in the most biofriendly ways. So um, anyway, this was our farm when I moved to our new farm, but it's now our farm that we are I don't believe you can ever own land, but it's where we're staying and living. And so there was like life and segregation resistant pigweed. This was the field um, right outside our office. They didn't notice the place. <laughs> That's what we looked right outside the door. So, but this flower flowers in October. It's covered in bees. That's our fall food for our pollinators. Super important. Um, so yes, we don't want our pastures. There's no grass. Like it really hurts the grass. But as we've gotten so healthier, these they're still there, but they're not totally shading out like this was. So um, anyway, I'm not going to go through this. But basically, we grow in compacted soil. It's in the talk online. I can explain. But it's basically there's biological reasons, there's physical reasons of the compaction, and there's chemical reasons of the forms of nitrogen in the soil. They're all related. They're all one. When we're talking, we're talking to a physics person or like let's say you're talking to your doctor and you're sick well they could culture your blood and you have a bacterial infection or they could look at your ph and it's off chemically right like okay are those two different things no they're just different ways of they're different ways of looking in the same house it's like looking through a different window you know if you go over there it's going to look different you're going to describe it differently but you're looking into the same thing so it's not like the biologist is better than a chemist is better than a naturopath or whatever it's that each person has their own lenses and their own paradigms, their own testing, their own association of correlations that they use to pattern, to understand the patterns of diseases. And um, there's a um, friend of mine who has a rare disease, and they said it was this, and now they said it's not that, it might be this and that, and your rheumatoid arthritis is this. And I just tell her, like, all the diseases are just names for a set of symptoms, right? Like, so inflammation is going to cause all these symptoms, and it's going to be very easy for doctors to be confused about what you do or don't have or whatever. I don't mean, you know, confined by your diagnosis, like, because that's not the problem. And just like this, like, weeds are not the problem. They are actually the solution to the problem. They're helping to heal the compaction or the disturbance. And um, we think they're the problem, generally. Uh, probably in this group, not as much. Yes? You know, on that, on that note, there's a marvelous biologist, and you love, you love the book, you'll actually read it, um, by <laughs> Katrina Blair. And it's called The Wild Wisdom of Weeds. Oh, I have that one. Yes. It's it awesome. It's super. I read the passages and yeah. the pictures. 
<laughs> and he's like, wow, we're like, why do we want to, like, I'm in our garden, and there's, like, plantain, burdock, and this, and I'm like, well, why am I trying to, like, plant perennial polyculture when there already is one? <laughs> and it's great, you know, so we just don't know how to use it, um, but uh, that is a great book, and I think it, did you read it? I, I read more of that one than a lot of people. <laughs> well, it's got lots of pictures and then the captions, you know, and the headings, bold headings and little boxes and summaries, and, you know, that helps me. You know? So, um, so, when we think about the food web, we can think of our microbes as kin. Um, there was someone in our fireside chat last night, and he was from Brown, and he was doing his He's like, I want to talk about how now farmers that are building soil are, are thinking of kinship with microbes and earthworms. And and I was like thinking, well, farmers have, I know that I've read books. I actually have read books from the 1930s and 40s because when I wanted to do that cover cropping, those were the books that already knew the economics of rye and off green pea and they knew how the cover crops worked. And, and so we kind of forgot that microbes are, they might not have known microbes per se then, but that the earthworms, like Will Allen showed me an article written, I can't remember what year, but way back in the day, and it was about the economics of the earthworms, and it compared it economically to the labor of men, and I can't remember how many men working full-time in your soil it equated, but it was intense, you know, and it's like... Including including that. Okay, so... um, We can think about how to structure this movement, like the soil food web, you know, and think of this as our kin. Um, and a lot of traditions did think of nature as a kin. I was reading something about the Inuits. They thought that we could change, you know, their, what they experienced was humans could change to animals, animals could change to humans, we were brothers and sisters, there's no problem. You know, and that was just the way it was. They said no one could explain it, but that was how life was, you know. And, um, and natural succession, like, think about this in our human design system with your weeds, like, again, with these permaculture things or pastures, like what are the foods that naturally would happen in that succession? What are the things that would be happening in nature in that succession and how can we mimic them? And um, know that the below the ground it, succession is mirroring what you see above the ground. So again, this, this testing, soil testing, like you can walk out there and if there's locust trees and blackberries, you kind of know more about the soil is different than if there's, you know, dandelion and uh, creasy salad or whatever weeds are growing there. So um, you can see patterns, and they're all microclimates even within that. Like there can be a fungal plant with moss under it, very compacted bacterial microcosm. So nature works in patches. Um, working in succession, think about your field now and where, what do they need? Um, are we supposed to end now? <laughs> okay, good. Six more minutes. So learning your best options, seeing seeing the problem as a solution, and that's not my phrase, but really the weeds are the solutions. How can we help them do it better? And um, what we did was we actually accelerated their healing by feeding the soil and stomping them down. Like, so we we made sure we stopped harmful disturbances. We weren't, we weren't, and we have a disturbances chart at our booth, and actually I meant to pass out, there were speaker handouts. Anyway, we have some handouts, um, packages, which have a chart of disturbances. You can see if anything you're doing is harmful, potentially positive disturbance. Um, and then we create habitat, you know, because a lot of times you just create the habitat, your biology is going to come back, like it's there and it's just us that keeps destroying it because it wants to be there. So a lot of times you can really save money and time and stop being the doer by just doing these two things. You don't have to always add microbes or feed microbes or put out sprays or, you know, like really it's like, look, the most bang for my buck that I get when I'm working with people is working with their system to just stop doing what's harming the system and stop wasting time and energy doing things that destroy the habitat and just set up the habitat. Um, and then you're going back to that highway example, your human intervention, and, and they talk to this, is um, <laughs> you know, just one, the least amount of like little nudge back, you know, and it's, it's more graceful than um, trying to whip the system into shape and fight nature. Um, so, and then if you can't, 
Like if you're if you can't even get a plant to grow, I worked with some soil, you can't even get a cover crop to grow, you know, then you're not gonna have any sugar, you're not gonna have any habitat, and sometimes you have to feed the plants through the leaf, and that's when you do some foliar spray, because like if we've got to bump that plant and not help, we can't wait for the whatever the soil to take you know a month or two to wake up like we do foliar feed. But that's way down in the chain, and that's really expensive, and we rarely recommend it unless you're in certain systems with certain value crops. Um, awesome. Aww. So um, then, you know, what Dan mentioned about the pests and pathogens, the larval forms of insects eating your plant, is like maggots eating your body. That's how sick the plant is. You know, do we really want to kill that pest or pathogen and then put it into the food chain? Like, why not let it be compost? Because, you know, if fungus is eating your plants, it's becoming compost. It will not support higher life. Like, why are, we wonder why we're sick. So, this is not, when we're focusing down here, we are not mirroring nature. We are fighting nature, which wants to take things that will not support higher life back into the food chain at a, I'm not saying higher life, like it's better, but just different forms of life. But, um, so I'm not going to go into these slides because they're, but they're on the, they're teaching about what are the fungal foods, what are the bacterial foods, how do you know what to feed, um, and think about is there something you're doing that you could stop doing that would actually help your system, right? Because that's the most bang for your buck. If you're paying money to do something in time, it's going to help your goal of like not doing less and achieving more. <laughs> what we started to talk about with. So think about what you can do right now. Write down any thoughts you have that you might not remember later. Um, and we just talked about that. You can think about what problems you had last year, but that's not where you want to manage, right? You want to be aware of that problem, of that thing, but you want to take action out of what you want. So if you need help figuring out what you need to do to feed your soil for what you want, reach out to me. We've got my business cards, has my cell phone on there, email. Um, that's, that is not a hard, usually not a hard thing, but it's just knowing that you need, seeing that you're focusing on a problem is usually the hardest thing. Because we get, I do it too, like get fixated on it and we start focusing energy on it and it just is like that vortex you pulled into it. So, um, Anytime you're feeling like you're being pulled in a lot of directions, just think, am I, am I like focusing on the problem here? Like, this doesn't feel too good. Like, it's not like, like what I want, you know, and then like, oh, is there a sunset behind me? Am I looking in the wrong direction here? Um, so, this is the case study that we go through, and you'll see the video online and on that train. Um, we don't know, it's a 10 minute video, so I don't have time to show it now, but I can show it if anybody wants to stay. Um, is that this was this horse fashion? That is a real horse. That's not a midget horse. Um, <laughs> she's not a small horse either. And these are lamb quarters. Uh, it was a year I got cattle, and my dad just, I tried for eight years on his farm, showing his vision that I could live on the farm and I could be there for him and mom, you know, and he just didn't want me to get your own farm, get your own farm. Okay. So finally left the own farm, which seems a little bit on it, and we have like all this land. But, um, so, got my own farm, but I had the horses back, I had no fences, so I got an ore grass, because uh, it was chemically farmed crop fields that were tilled. Um, so, basically, had the horses back at this other farm, and because, this is like, this is actually a longer story, this is, it was turned to mud, because we had eight horses, and we had a snowstorm, and they were left like a week longer, and it got torn, turned to mud. And we show how that was the previous winter, and we stopped out a bunch of hay and manure. We fed fungal food to the soil because bare soil, then the weeds, then your grass, right? That's that succession chart, and I kind of breeze through it really fast. But weeds, these kind of weeds grow between bare soil, compacted soil. They grow in compacted soil that was bare or disturbed, and they're not quite at healthy, diverse grasslands that we want for our pastures. So. Around the shed, this area popped up in all these weeds. Now you can see all the grasses, and actually in the videos, it goes into much more stages over these three-year period. You get to see different dates of what the field looked like. But we saw that the grasses were coming back, and yes, there was a flush of weeds. We really weren't concerned about it. But I really thought that I needed to control those weed seeds, 
and um, they were all viable, and I had meant to just run a weed eater there, but I didn't get back to the farm, and here it is October, and the stuff is senescing, um, the seed is really viable, and that was what the seed, you know, the seed was definitely coming viable, and millions of weed seeds were stomped down. Now, we didn't use any mowers, we didn't use any weed eater, we just used our temporary reel, and the hay that we were already starting to feed the horses, a little bit of hay, and I kind of just made a pass through so they weren't scared. We made a box around it, and we started stomping the soil. So that was September 3rd, and about October 2nd, look at the weed stomp. Like, I mean, this is multiple flower rows, that's a whole different issue, that's a whole more fungal plant, that's in a different part of the pasture that didn't get this compaction. But um, these last quarters is being stomped down, and so then I'm like, well, here I'm really going to prove the what Elaine said. It's either going to work or it's not going to work because here's this fertile manure and hay and some nice compost that I'm stomping all these weed seeds in. Like, is it, I don't know what the next spring is going to look like. People are coming to my dad going, Mr. Dixon, do you need someone to mow the fields? Like, can you do that economically for it? It was right on the highway, you know, and all the guys who work for him like, what's going on? And I'm like, don't mow the field. And, but, um, so this is the next fall one, it was uh, 13 months later, I think it was October, and that's the last part that grew. So you can see the grasses were more healthy, shiny, um, and there was no chemicals, no seed, no fertilizer, no compost, other, why I say compost, what I meant was we used, we patterned, so every time you walk across your land or do anything, you're impacting it, and all we did was, we knew the horses feed hay, we only had fed it in the shed, right? And then we take the manure and we would, this is before I knew about soil biology, and we would put it in the manure spreader and then we would haul it and either put it in a pile or spread it on the fields or whatever, all this work, right? And so what I started doing was just when I mucked out the shed, there was hay, there were stems that the horses didn't eat, and those are great fungal foods, and I learned that from the lake. So I'm like, okay, the manure is bacterial, the hay is fungal, we want a one-to-one -one ratio for grasslands, okay, this is perfect mixture. And so I would walk the shed and I would just sprinkle it out on the land, like just a couple steps instead of hauling in a wheelbarrow somewhere. Um, and then I was worried because of the fly populations right there, like this great fly mass thing. And so we can talk about that more. We talk about it more on how what happened in that part of the issue. But um, it's turned out really well and we compost in the fields now and it works great. Um, we do it in a way that there's a lot of carbon, so we're not leaching a lot of stuff out. And that's really important, and I talk, there's a nuance to this, like making a manure layer cake. It's like my specialty, so. Um, <laughs> and I've trained a lot of people, and in doing that, you learn that you explain it one way, and then you come out and you're like, oh, well, they didn't do this, and then you're like, oh, I didn't tell them this. So then you're like, now I need to have manuals and pictures on how to do this, because it's like keeping the soil covered. You tell someone to keep the soil covered, but really, is it covered if there's like little gaps in there or like there's stages of cover? So like what, we're, what I'm doing is trying to use pictures and we get into the nitty gritty detail in my trainings of like here's the five stages of land cover and what it looks like at each stage so that then you know what it means when I say keep the soil covered. I mean, our sales says that because I've seen a lot of different interpretations. So it's all the devils in the details with this, and I'm just naturally, what I realize is what my brain is naturally doing, I was talking about the guys in the database, we're trying to make an app where growers can say, well, how tall is your tomato plant, and what do the leaves shape like? Are they skinny, are they wide, are they glossy? And then our brains naturally do this. Like when I'm in the field, I naturally, or you're cooking, you have whoever cooks or whatever you do that's natural for you, you have an artistic way about it, you would instinctively know to add a little more of this or a little more of that or do this or turn the stove off at this time because that cast iron is getting too hot or whatever. And it's the same with land management and that it's, it's artistry at the mastery level. And, but we all can be artists and those things can be somewhat distilled down into resources. And so I think that, that's really what I believe is important is like, we used to have a culture of apprenticeship where you didn't get to make shoes until you spent time with the master, or you didn't get to do this. And when I was studying with the horses, I had to work as a working student, and I had to call under houses and get snake eggs out, or polish silver, or wax the floors, or whatever for my training. And that gave me a good work ethic, but not everyone now, like they just want to Google something and watch a five minute video and know how to do it. So it's a different culture, and 
um, not everyone can leave their farms and be a, an intern or an apprentice. Like there are some, there's a dairy grazing apprentice program that's really great, but you've got to leave your farm and, and for two years work on their farm and you may have an opportunity. But I realize that we've lost mentorship. And so part of the point of this talk is we are all mentors for each other. We can help each other when we're falling off the wagon or doing too much. Um, and, and in that company, besides being a farmer, I've chosen to try to bring back mentorship as an art and use technology to facilitate real human connections and relationships. So live events, plus getting on the phone, plus some learning hub online and things like that. So there's ways we can mirror nature, and this is the video I can play later, but um, the idea is that we, we saw the weeds not as the problem. We saw that actually from there, where we want to go, we were right on target. And we knew to keep going. And um, that's another farm. But this was a bare soil overgrazed pasture. We did the same similar hay feeding program. We didn't have temporary fences. And this is like what the horse manure looked like after six weeks. It was all worm casting. So it bigger than my finger. So that's natural fertility. No fertilizers. But it didn't happen when I was worming my horses. It didn't happen when I was removing the manure from the fields or dragging the pastures. Like, this never happened. And I managed these pastures for almost 20 years. So um, it only happened when we started doing